Africa's creative and adaptive Hi, I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. Our TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. Africa is a rich and varied continent with a rich and varied history. Africa's creative and adaptive cultures have sustained themselves for thousands of years in a tremendously wide variety of climates and ecosystems ranging from harsh deserts to dense jungles. Our school systems and our mainstream media have failed to inform the American people about Africa. Much of what Americans think they know is simplistic, distorted, or just not true. And interestingly, while the Olympia FOR's TV series has persisted for 23 years, this is the first program that we've devoted entirely to Africa. And I hope that we'll be able to do more into the future. And so the program title for this episode is Starting to Understand Africa. We have three guests who will help us understand what's going on. We have Jens Dieter Stommer, Emil Muda, and Rebecca Choll. Each of these three guests has experienced different backgrounds and different insights. Uh, Jens Dieter Stommer is well known and well respected in the greater Thurston County area and beyond. He has a long standing passion for helping people understand Africa and for helping African people connect with each other. Emil Muda is a lawyer who practiced law in his home country of Tanzania. His first language was Swahili, and he interprets five languages from the countries in southeastern Africa. Rebecca Chol spent her early years in Sudan, which has suffered terrible violence for several decades. She came to the United States as a refugee and attends college here. So welcome to all three of you. Good to have you here. We are in for a juicy and informative conversation. Thank you. Thank so you. This will, Thank this you will be good. Thank you. Uh, as I said in the introduction, Americans really don't understand Africa. It's a myth that Africans were, were ignorant and barbaric savages who had no history until Europeans came there and gave them civilization. Uh, but that myth persist, has persisted because it allowed the Europeans to commit their acts of slavery and colonialism. And that, uh, that heritage persists with a lot of American ignorance and, and disparagement. Um, we need to understand Africa from Africa's own perspectives and uh, not just from white and European 
uh, an American perspective. So can you give us uh, some basic information? Uh, tell us what, where the name Africa came from. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Anderson. The Africa, the term Africa, when you, you look at it, it's uh, defined in three languages. In Latin, it's, it's Africa. It's A-P-F-I-K-A. -A. That's in Latin. Mm -hmm. But the meaning of it is continent without cold. And uh, we have another one is Africa. A, this is, a, that's an Egyptian. A-F-P-R-I-K-A. -A. But the, that's Egyptian. But the meaning is the same. The continent without cold. Without but cold. The cold. Without the, meaning without law. No, no, without Is cold. It? Cold without. Uh, oh, without cold. Without cold. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. got it. So the term Africa. So you can write. That's from Bantu, which is the biggest group of Africa. You can spell it as A F R I K A. That's in Bantu, O A F R I F R I C A, which is in English. Uh -huh. By the meaning of Africa in the Bantu language, it means the best birthplace of human being. Wow. That's in the Bantu, which is the largest group in Africa. I want to just show a map uh, of Africa so people, the viewers, can get their bearings. Um, it's a huge continent. Europe is above it, um, and uh, Arabia would be off to, to one side. Correct. Um, and India and so forth farther on. Um, and we'll be talking with your experiences from your home country, home countries. Um, Rebecca, you're from Sudan, which is here. It's just south of Egypt. Yep. And uh, Emil, you're from uh, Tanzania, which is uh, also on the east, it's on the coast, a little bit up from Madagascar, the Correct. big island. Yes. Just so we have some idea. So the two of you are from here, these places. And we'll be talking about those later, but uh, we'll have occasion to, to uh, show the map yes. during the show again. Okay. Um, what, what are some, uh, well, it's a huge continent. and. Tell us, tell us how big that is. Yeah, you, you are right. The Africa, apart from being the historical continent of, of being source of a human being in this or the world, is the second largest. But if you need to know the size of Africa, is four times of America. That's how the African is big. Right, I've seen a map uh, that, that draws the outline of the U.S. 48 states and China, and they both fit easily within the continent of Africa Correct. with space left over. Yes. So it's bigger than the United States yes. and, and uh, China put together. Exactly. So it's, it's huge. And there are probably more countries in Africa than on any other continent. Yes, we are about 53 mm -hmm. national, independent, but we get independence different times again. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and possible, possible two more in the near future, one, two, three years. Yeah, they are going to separate. Uh, possible Western Sahara if uh, the negotiations with the UN uh, after a long time uh, bearing fruit, that Western Sahara get an own country and then uh, possible South, South and Sudan. Sudan. Yeah. Um, um, Let's look at some of the pre-colonial history. As I mentioned in the introduction, mm -hmm. there's this, this notion that, oh, they didn't have any history until we came there and brought civilization to them. But I was impressed with the background reading that I did, how they had well-developed um, iron and other uh, metallurgy, and they were making things, and they were very sustainable in the environments. And, uh, generally made society work in all kinds of various ways in different places. Yeah, it's, it's quite a true. You know, the history, the one who wrote the history, he liked the part of his favorite. But Africa as Africa, 
as I told you from the beginning, is the origin of the human being. So before the colonial came in, Africa was, I can say it was heaven, because mm -hmm. every part of Africa has his own leadership, and most of them was a chiefdom. Mm -hmm. You find every part there is a structured government, respected, and even if there is any misunderstanding, they have a way to solve their dispute without killing or running away. Mm -hmm. So the Africa, before the European came in, was harmony. Mm -hmm. Everything was in the brotherhood. And by the way, it was just a piece of land with no demarcation. Right. You so didn't, it yeah. didn't have a lines drawn no, out. Like no, no lines, no passport, no whatever. Yeah, you yeah. can travel from, from South Africa yeah. to, to Egypt. Yeah. Nobody who could ask. Except wherever it, it get dark, you go to the neighbor, they give you food, you sleep, and in the morning you could proceed uh -huh. without any, any problem. Yeah. I, I know in, uh, a few months ago we did a program about how to resolve uh, conflicts and crimes in ways that are reconciling. And one of the models for some of that kind of work is what has been done in some African local areas where if somebody violates a law of the village or the tribe, they bring the person out and they, they work it through as a whole community until they can restore that person Correct. in good standing to the village. And they often do that by affirming the good things about the, pe the yes. person or mm -hmm. some way to make mm -hmm. things right and restore that person to community, which is altogether different than the blaming that we do in this country. Yes, Anderson, you can, uh, you can see this. We have a vivid example, which is recent. We have a country like Rwanda who faced genocide. Mm -hmm. The international community, they put tribunal, Arusha, they put tribunal in Hague. Yeah. But this tribunal, they didn't do nothing except spend the money. But Rwanda employed their former system of how to dissolve the dispute. Right. This system is called gachacha. The gachacha means a victim and a killer. They meet together. So remember, those killers were in the jail. But the government spent money to feed them. The orphan suffer in the street. Government feed them again. But they, they find there is no peace. Even if we are going to get the conviction killing, it doesn't dissolve the dispute. The kid of the killer, mm -hmm. they are going to see the victim as an enemy too. Okay. So now the government of Rwanda say, hey, let us do one thing now. Bring the victim and the killer so that they, they can reconciliate. So once the victim comes in front of this victim and then ask forgiveness, they give the time of forgiveness with the government watch. But this person, he lived hand in hand with this victim. But it worked out, now it has been there for, 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 for three years now, mm -hmm. since it started, and it's working well. Now the victim is working hard to feed the orphan, and the, 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 the job of government is to make sure people they are living together in harmony, yeah. which is quite different with the European system. Yeah. When oh, you yeah. kill, you are killed. Right. It doesn't bring the brotherhood together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you're from Tanzania, and some yes. people might re remember the previous name, uh, Tanganyika. Exactly. Um, and again, on the map, I'll show where that's at here. It's um, right here on the eastern side of Africa, uh, a little below halfway down. Um, and uh, tell us something about your country's history before the colonial era. Yeah, before colonial, <clears throat> remember, to get the name Tanganyika, to get Nigeria, to get Sudan, to get whatever, that was after scum of Africa, partition of Africa, which was done in Germany, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, 18th century. 
but Tanganyika, it comes, the name itself, it's from the Arab. It is a two name, Tanga, just roaming. Nyika is Savannah. Okay. So the white men meet with the Arab, the Arab carrying ivory. So the white say, hey, where do you get that thing? Because the Arab, he didn't, he don't know how to speak English. Say Tanga Tanga Nyika. It means <laughs> I just roam about in the in the savanna. I uh -huh. get this. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the, the white because he just said this is the Tanga uh -huh. That's how we get the name. Yeah. But immediately after independence, that was 1961. The former president called Mwari Nyerere think it is wise to make. These two, because we have Tanzania mainland and we have small, small island. And those island was occupied with Sultan, Arab. So Nyerere helped the Tanzania, the Zanzibar and the Pemba to fought to get independence from the Arab. Okay. Immediately after the independence, they joined together to form one nation called Tanzania. Okay. But the name Tanzania, it means the good thing. T-A-N, it means Tanganyika, the first letter of Tanganyika. And Z-A, Zanzibar. And Nia, N-I-A, the last, the last word is purpose. It means is Tanganyika and Zanzibar join with one purpose. Oh. Mm. That's where Tanganyika, and that's how Tanzania means. And, uh -huh. and the political name is United Republic of Tanzania? Yeah, it's, it's uh -huh. United Republic of Tanzania. Uh -huh. So it's two Republican United. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to connect with your country, which okay. is at a different place in the map. We showed it a few minutes ago. Right. But Sudan is this very, very Large. big country. It's the biggest country in Africa, you mm -hmm. said. Yeah. And uh, it's up here just south of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, tell us something about the, the people and the culture from Sudan, where you came from. Well, the people in South Sudan, I, I say South Sudan because the, the, uh, the whole Sudan is divided in our heart as to north and south. The north are the Muslim, and after the Civil War that was going on and is still kind of going on, we have a peace agreement right now that's kind of, uh, I think it's going to end within the next year or so. And we're going to have to like go back and maybe redo the peace agreement or we're going to go back to the fighting again or it's just going to, it, we'll just have, we'll just have to see in the next year or so. But um, the people in the South Sudan are cattle people. From the beginning of time, they were just cattle people. They live off their land, they live off their cattle. They hunt, the men go hunt, and the women stay home and take care of the babies and take care of the gardens or whatever they have. And <clears throat> what else? Um, <laughs> sorry, my throat is a little dry. The people of South Sudan are very um, proud people, I should say, in their, in their culture, in their heritage, in everything they do. They're just proud. They could fight to the death just by just the name of South Sudan. They have, um, they have to, they actually name their cows, like their cattles, they make, they name them like pets. So when you kill a cow, you don't just kill it. You have to like have this ceremony, just like the Native Americans. They had, they had to use the whole cow up and it was just like pretty much like a baby, like a part of the family. So you use it, you make sure you have, you know, you thank the gods for it and you make sure you, it's, you feed it well. And it's just, it's your, it's, um, it's your pro product. You actually, you grow it, you, um, you raise it from like day one to like until you kill it. And you have to kill it yourself. No one else could do it. You could have like this little bull and you would just raise it and you could do some decoration to it. And, you know, it's just a sign of proud. And they're just very, very proud people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, um, I understand, I did some background <coughs> readings so, so I know what I'm, Oh, yeah. So I have some context for oh, yeah. doing this. Mm -hmm. And I know that for uh, stretches of, for several years at a time since mm -hmm. 1956, right. um, the, 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 uh, the northern government has tried to impose that harsh 
uh, variation of Islamic law, the Sharia. Yes. It's been sort of a coming and going of mm -hmm. on and off. And and the South is, is, as you mentioned to me when we were preparing for the program, the South right. is partly Christian. And then there are a lot of people, I think, who, who still adhere to other older religious. Right. It's very, um, I don't know what you call it. It's just like what Native American had. It's like you don't believe in one God. You have like, you have the God God, and then you have like goddesses and gods in, you know, beneath that. You could have, you could call it, like it could be a snake, and you would just, you know, feed that snake and make it your God. Or it could be like a piece of stick. It could just be anything, or a tree. And it could be like traced through your ancestors that way too. Your ancestors could be like, okay, that's all God, and you decorate it. It could be a piece of drum, yeah. you know, it just, anything. And it's very much rooted in that place, right, in that, yeah. in that uh, culture mm -hmm. and the, in the mm -hmm. people. They, they believe that everything has a spirit, everything has a spirit, even the trees do have a spirit. When the war came to our village, which was like one of the biggest villages in South Sudan, um, they, they took everything. They took the homes, they took the, um, the crops, the, the women even. They killed, they killed the men and then they took the women and the children and, mm -hmm. and the old. And they took, they even took down the trees. And some people, they even cried more for the trees instead of what they saw, you know, around them. Mm -hmm. It was just, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, and the conflict between North and South has continued off and on mm -hmm. uh, since 56, uh, right. politically, between those, mm -hmm. uh, the North being more Arab-oriented and sure. Muslim-oriented and mm -hmm. South different. Um, and you had the a big starvation uh, in, around 1988. Yes. And um, then the general, uh, Bashir seized power in a coup mm -hmm. in 1989 and just was a, a ruthless dictator. Mm -hmm. um, and tell, so tell us something more about the, the Civil War. I mean, because you, your country has just been <laughs> through a lot. Up in, yeah, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, when the Civil War started, it was like um, we, have, we have this celebration we do every year, is we call it our Independence Day. We call it actually um, uh, May 16, and there's another word for it, but usually we just call it May 16 because that's when that happened. Um, President, late President, um, Vice President of South Sudan, Karang Mabur, Dr. Karang Mabur, was the one that actually broke um, away from the South and um, from the North and made South um, free because it was just like slavery from like the first time the European came in. They, um, they, they gave power to the northern. They, um, they took the south and they just pretty much beat them down to the ground. They say, this is your land, just do whatever you want to do with it. They don't give them any resources, they don't give them anything. Most of the resources of South Sudan, of Sudan are in South Sudan and they just come and take it as they, as they please. They don't have anything, they don't have any police, they don't have any, they have nothing. So from that day when Grandma Bio decided to say, okay, this is Anyanya 1, Anyanya 3, we took off and we, would, we just became independent and we were like, okay, we will just stand, stand by and we're going to just fight for our country and we, we just call that South Sudan. We don't call that the whole Sudan because the, we don't believe in, um, in their laws, like the Sharia and stuff. We are Christian. Most, most of Sudanese um, South, South Sudan are Christians. The Muslims wanted to control the whole land of, South, of Sudan, and we were just like, we're not going to have it, we're not going to have it. And so it just kept going on through this little tunnel that just never ended, and it's just like, just keep going, just keep going. So your, your sense is that it, it, it really mm -hmm. naturally ought to be two different countries. It should be, yeah. And the people, from what you've told me mm -hmm. in preparing for the show, it sounds like the people of the South feel like you're a separate Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's we separate. we fell from day one that we were, we were separate from from the Arabs. We yeah. call them just you know just Arabs. We don't use the term religions as much as people do here because religion is not the most uh, the most interesting um, important thing in my in my culture because of the gods that I told you about before. We have our own little gods and stuff, and everything else should live in harmony, like he said. Mm -hmm. And they just. They just want to put it, Sharia, you know, Muslim is this, Muslim is this, Muslim is this. Mm -hmm. And we're like, no, it's not going to happen. We are Christians. We are this. We are that. 
we just we're not gonna we're not gonna live under one law. Yeah, so it sounds like you're, you're separate people. Right, compared to the very very separate. We're like the in, you know, the original people of Sudan, mm -hmm. and they came like you know a few years later back. Yeah. yeah so yeah. addition on that, mm -hmm. the member when uh, <clears throat> when these religion <coughs> spread, mm -hmm. the Muslim they came first. When they reach in Sudan, if you are not a Muslim, they call you kafir. Kafir yeah. is the caste. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if there is a Sharia, to kill you, a kafir, is not a sin. Mm -hmm. It's like you are getting credit to Allah, to God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to implement that kind of law and to see <coughs> South Sudan as the, the caste, the God doesn't want them. It's like they are, they are helping God to finish them. Mm -hmm. But remember again, this, the issue of the region came, came later. The Africans, I told you, Africans are Africa. We have their way of belief. As I told you, we have the, the way we worship. Some, they worship their God is in the mountain. Like Tanzania, some other tribe, they know their God is in, in the mountain, Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. So the season of planting, they may say, hey, God of season, we, we are begging the good harvest. So the, the same God is going to bring a nice rain mm -hmm. without any thunder or flood. Mm -hmm. That's how they pray. So when the Muslim came in, start to, to distort that. So not only in Sudan, even in Tanzania, when you are, you are not a Christian, you are not a, we call it, we call it Mustalabu. Mustalabu is, you are a star from Arab. If you have to put those kind of clothes, then you know you are really more civilized. But if you don't like, or you don't want to put it on, they see you as the caste, as the uncivilized. Mm -hmm. So you are not Mustalabu. Yeah. So they start now from there. Once you're in the power, you need those people to follow what you need. Mm -hmm. So that's how it comes. Is, do, you, do you think that um, the religions um, through the colonial power uh, was also misused in, as a political tool? Correct. Yes. Um, and I, you know, that's a sad thing uh, for those who study Africa that they really maybe understand that that if you take the religion, like for my wife, um, she said that they lived with Muslims together, you know, and it was no yes. problem. But in, in, the, in the point where any leader comes up and takes political advantage uh, uh, for one party or something like that, then the real danger starts. Yep. So, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. and, that, and that's why you, you may find the leader who saw that thing before, like um, Nkwame Kuruma, mm -hmm. Nyerere himself, who will say, well, you, we are Christian, you are Muslim, mm -hmm. but our government has no religion. Yes. Yeah. That, that was the statement. Mm -hmm. So the vivid example you can see, like Tanzania, where I come from, we don't have that thing, but to balance of it, when we get independence, remember, the missionaries, when they came in, they came with two. They came with a gun, with a gun in the right hand. Yeah. The yeah. Bible. Yeah. In the, so, like Native tells, America. Yeah. yeah. It tells you what. But when they came in, in, in Tanzania, they did good. Uh -huh. They built the schools. They built the hospitals. They, right. they did a good job. Yeah. But no Muslim kid who want to go to the missionary school saying they are going to be baptized. Right. So it reaches a place where you find the Muslim there, they are down in education, but immediately after getting independence, they say no. Every school should be under government. Yeah. Missionaries, you can teach wherever you, we bring to you. Don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Now we find, at this rate, you find now Tanzanians, Muslim, Christian, we are together. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we go ahead, we, we make a constitution. Once the president is the Muslim, then vice president should be a Christian. And this, Glenn, it works good. This, Glenn, I feel, 
are some of the many, many success stories from the African continent yeah. which really need to be highlighted in our yeah, education exactly. and put into a history book. Right. This is a success to, to, to do yeah. that mm -hmm. and, and a model for, for other uh, right. communities. Right. Yeah, and and I I want to make sure that people watching the show don't think that we're negative toward toward Islam because no, no. Oh, no, no, no. oh no, no, absolutely it's not. A great absolutely religion, not. and yes. and it has a lot of good uh, unifying features in uh, in like in some parts of Africa where people were uh, or groups were not getting along. They mm -hmm. find this as a universal thing that they can all have in common. So it's been a good unifying force for some. Uh, Various yeah, communities. You, you are, you are so right. it, it, but it seems to, it seems like when people get um, a, a harsh political agenda, <laughs> then they can abuse any exactly. whatever religion they have. Exactly. You see that with the extreme fundamentalist Christ Hindus in yeah. India, or you see that with the Christian uh, as well. Har Unfortunately, yeah, har uh, hardcore people in whatever kind that are <laughs> not willing to be human together with the other folks. Yeah, yeah of course, it's the issue of the human. I was responding to the gentle <coughs> point. Muslim itself is the peace. Mm -hmm. they, 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 preach, they preach just a peace. Even mm -hmm. if you say the Quran is just a peace, the peace, they preach peace. But once, a stu I can say the stupid reader, go to the power, he fulfill his need, not not He's the, the not the Quran. Mm -hmm. When you mm -hmm. see the Quran and the Bible, it's it's the same. Yeah. Old Testament and the, and the Quran is the same thing. And very often, his personal need, not even the need of his people. His exactly. Response. His personal yeah. need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that that's a big difference. Um, I, something I when I was doing some background reading for this and looking at the <coughs> the, the old colonial history, it was. Interesting that, that some of these European countries that had little trade outposts, they were in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, they were just little, they had little trade outposts and they were just on the coast. They had not gotten inland. And we think of the colonial era, but the colonial era was really hitting its peak in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And before that, there was a little bit of European encroachment for trade and the corporations, the companies were running. Uh, exploitation. There's a quote um, one writer referred to the way the, the European businesses ran colonial Africa as an economy of pillage. Mm -hmm. They were just in there getting whatever they can and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so in, in the context of all those colonial abuses that really seemed to hit a peak in the late 1800s, early 1900s until they became really a drain on Europe and they it was like spending all this money and they couldn't control it. It's like, and it makes me think, what are we doing with this country now with the places that we try to run that aren't <laughs> ours to run? Right. Um, we got into this interesting, exciting time of liberation from colonialism that mostly ran in the 50s and the 60s. There's just a lot of excitement. And I wonder if anybody could, could talk about some of the dynamics. Certainly it varies from country to country but are some of the main dynamics that were happening. You know, I, I think after the First World War, the First World War, some African, they fought. When they fought in the in, in, in First World War, they come to realize, wow, <laughs> these people, they are nothing. <laughs> so we have to go back to fight for our independence. That's where the revolution started coming in. But before, before that, when they start coming, they think, yeah, this is a good people. They come here to, to, to do business with us. But with, with, with the, the years goes, the things change. They become to be masters. Mm -hmm. So when they become to be masters, in Europe, the war start. When they, stay, they started, they say, well, where can we go to find uh, the army? They have to run to their friends which is African. So can you support us? Some other African, they went to fight. When they fight, they say, oh yeah, we can do that thing. So the political movement now start the, then after the First World War. But started slowly, but after Second World War was 
Yeah. Was the, it, 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 it really took off. It, yeah. it took off. Yeah. And if I may uh, throw in, uh, a lot of people don't even realize that Africans, Africans served on European battlegrounds mm -hmm. because of colonial power not only raping uh, the, the country, they said, you're British, so you serve even under British command. Yep. I have a, I have a uh, when I was in Germany, still a, a beautiful picture of an you know, imperial guard was two Africans drummers on a horse. Yep. I mean, uh, so we, we, we don't even know that, and uh -huh. so you find even graves with Africans on a European Yes, in the European, yeah. And we, we, need to, we need to realize that. And, uh. and, and that's an example of the German and Tanzania. We are brothers. Not only being a colony of them, we fought several times during when they came in, and most of the Africans, they died in Germany, and the Germans died in, in, in Tanzania. Wow. So now the era we are in is we are brothers. So. Mm. Yeah. And that's why if I ever uh, in Africa, I mean, I, I, uh, after one day or two days, I ask one question. Where is the time of the unknown in your country? I did in Egypt. I take the time to go there and salute them because to realize that, that, that you know, I don't know how, how many have fought overseas and pay that respect. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I hopefully that's continue amazing. to do that. <laughs> Tell us your personal story uh, coming out of Sudan, and uh, tell, so tell, tell us your story. Okay, well, I came, uh, I, I was born in South Sudan. By the time I was two months old, we had, to, we had to flee my village, and we flee to northern Kenya in a place called Kakuma. My, my dad was killed. Well, so I thought it was my dad. Some, um, most of my family members were killed during um, the invasion. After um, the first five invasions that were going on through the south, of, um, the south Sudan, they moved to my village in 1989, and that was the year that I was born. We moved down to Kakuma, and then they, they started forming this, um, this group called the Lost Boys of South Sudan, and they, they start moving these kids from like um, villages to to um, to towns to um, uh, not towns to camps. They started they, they started in uh, in Ethiopia, and then that didn't work. So they had to stop. They had to move them again, and they moved them to Uganda. They they moved again, and they moved them to Kenya. And then that was like the most permanent part of the um, of the movement in 1992. They were placed in Kakuma, and around that time I was probably pretty young too. And my family members were placed as where they were like in Ethiopia, Egypt, wherever. Everybody was just pretty much running for their own lives. I ran with my three cousins. We moved down there, and we got our name listed on the Lost Boys of South Sudan. And about nine years later, eight years later, we were listed to come to the United States as refugees, and we moved here in 2001 and from then on I I met a wonderful family the Smiths were like just they believe in like goodness in people it doesn't matter where you're from you could be black white blue red doesn't matter and I was placed in this place called Lewis County Chehalis and it's a very remote place in my mind when I when I moved here I was like okay there's Seattle, there's Olympia, there's Tacoma, and I had to be placed in Chehalis. Okay, I think I could do this. <laughs> and I was 11 years old, so I had to go to, I started school in, um, in middle school, in sixth grade. And that was the first time in my life I ever went to school, wow. ever. In Africa, we have this thing like discipline. Not, not all Africa, but some, some countries. In Kenya, they have to discipline their kids. They use like whips to you know make them read better. They use um, pretty much anything to beat their hands or just a lot of beating basically. And I was too young, and somebody said, I don't know who, thought that I was too young to you know take the beating. So they say, okay, I'm just gonna stay home. So I went to kindergarten, and that was it. And then I just stayed <laughs> until I was 11, and I started school, and I was like, you know, just pretty much just running. I was I was not walking, I was running through school, like, okay, I gotta go to school, I gotta go to school. I started reading, I started, like, I started from, like, 
one, two, three, you know, started like ABC, just the basic stuff. And I was in sixth grade. And I, today, actually to this day, I don't even know how I did that because I'm in college now. I'm, I'm reading just like everybody else here. I'm, I'm doing math. I'm, it's pretty much just. You're on TV. Wow. Oh, <laughs> that too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just yeah. a wonderful experience. And I. And you said that you're, you're trying to get your AA degree and you want to be a social worker. Yes, I'm hoping to get my AA sometime next year, either in June. Oh. I'm hoping for June. Wow. I haven't. I started school. I started going to Centralia College. Um, the, the winter of 2009, but prior to that, I had my daughter in um, in the fall, so I had to like stay for that quarter, and I was like, okay. So I started a little late, and I had to take you know part time here, part time there because I'm raising a daughter, and mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to be a full time student and a full time mom. So mm -hmm. yeah, my daughter come first. So. Yeah. Yeah. How, how interesting that somebody who's from Sudan mm -hmm. thinks of Shahila as remote. <laughs> I know. Huh? <laughs> I will be sure and tell that to all my friends who live in Lewis County. It's amazing. <laughs> so, um, um, Jens, I want to check in with you for a bit because you've got some experience and, and a, a great reputation in the greater Thurston County oh, area okay. and beyond. Hmm. Um, can you share with us some of how you got this, this great passion for Africa? Well, that's, it's a... It's an interesting story, and I try to put it as short as possible. Yeah, well, uh, we have to because we're tired. Oh, you're yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but actually, too, um, in second marriage with my wife, who was uh, born in the village of Ogu, close to Port Harcourt, uh, a large family, um, and uh, my father-in-law, uh, uh, not a war canoe chief, uh, mm. chief in a compound and also in a circle of families who choose the village king. Uh, and um, uh, so that's one, one, one thing. Uh, the other is I had the opportunity through, uh, at the time at Evergreen, to um, represent a Canadian human rights organization at the United Nations World Conference Against Racism and Intolerance in, in Durban. The, City, yes, where, where, where we had this soccer, soccer game just had, oh, yeah. and uh, a success story, yeah. an African success story. Yeah. Um, and this experience, uh, seeing 20 to 40,000 people from around the world, and by the way, it was not only the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and first-hand experiencing that the United States walked out and even yeah. get asked by a, yeah. a, a South African taxi driver about that. Yeah. Um, seeing that and building friendships on the ground, uh, and then um, trying to see, before I left, the kingdom of the Zulu, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, skipped my flight back, mm -hmm. and then through that, uh, experiencing the hospitality of South African airline, not charging anything for my delay, uh, and arriving 9 in 9-11 uh, in in London. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, uh, that left, uh, a remark, and that left then to uh, founding two organizations, and one is the African Affairs Council of Washington State. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. You already had a prior experience, prior background of, of interest in indigenous people, people who come yes. from whatever Yes, and that uh, was instilled uh, through the experience having the honor living on a nearby Indian reservation. And that, uh, I think, was one of the best uh, teachings and learning experiences I had mm -hmm. uh, in my life. And I think that is a good preparation for it. So tell us about the African Affairs Council of Washington State. What it's a small do? organization, and the vision, our vision is as follows. Uh, we are not saying that we can speak for Africa, that we have all the knowledge about Africa, right. or that we intend to tell Africans what to do. That's not our mission. We are interested to bring Africans together in Washington state. Um, we uh, try to bring together friends of Africa. We have immigrants and American citizens who lived in Africa, Peace Corps workers, former military uh, scientists who have a passion for Africa. Why not to bring them together? But the major thing is also to um, look into the humanitarian uh, contribution of Washington State on the African continent. And right here, close by in Tamwater, is an example of a city 
uh, who chooses to build a relationship with a community in Uganda, in Mubende. And uh, that's just one. We have six sister cities associations. We, in, in Washington. In Washington. Six, six, six sister, sister city, city relationships. America. And yeah. uh, um, uh, we have colleges and universities who have built relationships, mm -hmm. nonprofit faith communities, mm -hmm. uh, and to bring them together, for example, in the annual day for Africa. Yeah. When we were getting to, together for the program mm. uh, here, you, you mentioned that a growing number of colleges are teaching Swahili. Yes, correct. Yeah, we, we, the African Union, they are struggling by now to see if they can get the one language which can unite Africa. So to start with, now you can see most of the colleges that's, that are teaching Swahili trying to make Swahili as the African language. And the uh, success behind that is Africa is a Bantu language, which is a big group of Africa. Mm -hmm. We have the, uh, the Swahili is Bantu language, Arabic, and the other Latin is in. It make one language called Swahili. So we are thinking if we start going inside, Teaching Swahili for most of the people is going to make at least one language. As you know, Africa, you may find, I have a brother from Mozambique, but we can't speak because they are speaking Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I have a brother from Angora, it's the same. I have a brother from Congo, speak French, I speak English. Mm -hmm. So you find now, we are the one, but we can't communicate. So how can we do? So this movement is going to succeed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the, this, uh, your organization, the African uh, Affairs Council of Washington State, the phone number, I want to put in a plug for that, it's area code 360-438-7087, and you will have a website up and running by the middle of Hopefully. August of 2010. Yes. And that will be www.aacwa.org, but that will be up middle of August middle of 2010 August. is what yes. you're aiming for. So um, tell us some more about A Day for Africa. You mentioned it briefly, and then tell us some more. That's in 2010. It's coming up on Friday and Saturday, September 24, 25, in Tumwater. Uh, Tumwater, um, especially uh, what I mentioned, we want to honor this commitment of uh, the nearby, nearby city of Tumwater and saying if you have a sister city relationship uh, established, uh, we need to honor that and we do a, a great effort to find a place uh, to do it in Tumwater. Um, the work we're doing, one is the uh, Day for Africa, working on a directory. Uh, the Day for Africa on the 24th and 25th, two days, um, on Friday, open it for hopefully participation of schools, and Saturday, uh, hopefully, a lot of uh, individuals uh, are coming to this day. We will invite over 120 organizations. I, I'm not saying that they all are coming, mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully, that will be the largest one we had so far. Mm -hmm. And you've done this for a couple of years now? It's a six uh, year. It started at St. John's Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. a very strong support uh, of my church. Uh, the reason why we are taking it out of the church is uh, that we want to be committed to be inclusive. And inclusive means to reach out to our uh, African Muslim brothers and sisters. And so that's why we always have the Day for Africa after Ramadan. Uh, and uh, the same respect to our Jewish uh, um, brothers and sisters that we don't do it uh, in Yom, uh, through Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're 24th and 25th. Okay. Um, we've covered a lot of the older history and the, the near, you know, the colonial era and the liberation stuff. Uh, briefly, of course, we've covered all of this stuff. <laughs> it was only one hour. <laughs> but I wonder, can we touch a little bit on more recent things, whether in Tanzania or in other countries that have, uh, whether had difficulties or had successes, just some other yes. examples that anybody may know of. We, we still, you know, the scar of colonialism is still there because when you look Africa as Africa, there is a, there is a, a still war going on. 
Now we can talk about the Congo, Congo Kinshasa. We can talk about uh, Brazzaville, Congo Brazzaville. Mm -hmm. They still have the problem, but there's a problem still on, and there's a success. The success, let's say, let's say, come like Tanzania. Tanzania, even if we are independent, we don't have the war, but the development is still poor. People, they are still poor. But why that? Because still the big company from, from Europe, they still have the hand on, on Africa, sucking the resource used in China, used in Europe, wherever you can mention. And the issue of corruption is still there. If somebody is in the power, instead of taking the money of aid, helping the people, the same person, a good example is Zimbabwe now, you can see. Instead of taking that money used to help people, he took the same money, put in the bank, somewhere in Europe. Yeah. But there is no international organization ask, hey man, we know you are president, we know you are salary, how do you have the billion dollar in that account? <laughs> but USC, they see it, they know it, they can't comment. And some, <laughs> they put that the same money in, Euro, in, 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 in America. Mm -hmm. But instead of asking, we send you 100 million to help malaria. But we see 50 million in your account, how it comes. Mm -hmm. Nobody who is willing to ask such kind of things because it's coming to them. Mm -hmm. that, that's the reason. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the colonial. Well, and I see some of this with the United States is is trying to militarize yeah. Africa with this new AFRICOM, this whole military exactly. superstructure to, and, and if you scratch a little bit below the surface, you find out that we're interested in the resources. Yes. <laughs> they've got oil <laughs> or they've got don't some minerals say. that we yeah. want. And you don't have to scratch very far before you find that. They say, oh, you, um, we're, we got the U.S. military uh, all over Africa for for humanitarian or mm. diplomatic kinds of stuff. No, you scratch a little bit below and it's the oil and it's the resources, the minerals. It's the same thing, it's thing like Sudan. Mm -hmm. yeah. If America will say, hey, hey, enough is enough, but we know for sure, the, the, South, the North Sudan, they are selling oil to, to, to China. Mm. China, they are taking the oil. Yep. And then, then America say, hey, hey, why are you doing to those people of South Sudan? The China say, hey, you are my friend. Why, why do you want to take my bread away? Mm. Keep quiet. Uh -huh. And then there's Nothing a peace happened. agreement going on. Mm -hmm. So the peace for 26 years fighting. Why don't you end it now? Mm -hmm. You know, it's something you see it, but the colonial, I can see it, the, the hand of colonial is still there. Yeah, and so the colonialism hasn't really gone away even no, after exactly. independence. Not yeah. even close. <laughs> Pardon me? I said not even close. Not even close. <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. Uh, are there some other things that we can say? We've got really just a couple of minutes left. Are there any other contexts or insights that people might have to help understand what's in the news now or what might be coming up? Uh, one thing I'd, I, I hope we could before we leave, need to be mentioned, this is an experience uh, I think you all share, mm -hmm. is the uniqueness of Africans um, recognizing themselves. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have seen it by myself with my wife in Frankfurt, uh, mm -hmm. approaching two Africans, we have no idea who they are, mm -hmm. a smile from far, at least five minutes, how are you, how is your parents, mm -hmm. uh, a unique experience. And I experienced myself at the UN, uh, I, I do the same. First, they look because I'm Caucasian. Okay. But if I put a little photo out, it show my family, the smile is there. I saw it in, in, in Frankfurt uh, talking to an architect from Nigeria. He was busy, even he was busy, he took this. To, what I want to say, a very unique uh, strait of welcoming. Then the teaching of Ubuntu, Ubuntu yeah. the oneness. Uh, you know, I wish it would be in the books. Number three is um, we, I'm advocating for partnerships. If we really want to understand and be involved in Africa, we need to consider partnerships like Tumwater. Uh, it could be sister partnership. 
could uh, a church or synagogue or mosque uh, partnerships mm -hmm. could be a trade partnership. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Yeah. If you take a partnership, then it's not them anymore. Right. It's the Joes and the Marys using this. Uh, and then you take a personal interest. And if something is happening, uh, you get involved in that. So I'd, I'd like to add this on to it. The, the thing that you said about, about the, um, the, the, the greeting, the, you know. Very unique. Re it reminded me of something I read just the other day preparing for the program, is that when, when Ghana became independent in 1956, it was like a really big deal. Mm -hmm. Really big deal, and people from you know dignitaries and heads of state from all over the world came to Ghana, yeah. and the United States spent, sent um, Vice President Richard Nixon, who was um, not not really well liked in this country actually, mm -hmm. but he he was so he but he went representing the United States in 15, this is 1956, and he saw a black guy there, as you would see, and he mm -hmm. went up and slapped him on the back and says, "How does it feel to be free?" <laughs> and the black guy says. I wouldn't know, Mr. Vice President, I'm from Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was the best story. That, uh, I mean, we, we've, we've got our own mm. history yeah, to deal with as well. Yeah. That was from 1956. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, to me, I was trying to, to wind up with uh, commenting about uh, the kindness of America, the kind of Washington state. You may see now we have a refugee, asylum, and other immigrants. There's a lot of programs out there helping these people. But remember, the DHS, Department of Health and Social, they don't know what these people need. They just go over them without making a study to know how to, they can save them. They use a lot of resources instead of go with these African themselves to ask what do you need we can help. They just come in, they find the energy they're using is a lot, and the money they're using is a lot, but nothing is achieved. Okay. I want to thank all of you. We're out of time. I want to oh. thank uh, Rebecca and Emil and Jens Dieter. I want to thank all the folks who've been watching. Thank you. We need to understand Africa from Africa's own multiple perspectives. Um, and Let's seek out firsthand perspectives, people and nonprofit organizations who are from Africa and who have track records of egalitarian working relationships with Africans. For information about a wide variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change, contact the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 360-491-9093 or visit our website, olympiafor.org. We're all one human family. We share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to do our part. And the world needs what you have to offer. Okay. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.